Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, so much for the opportunity to encounter your gospel afresh. Lord, your word gospel means good news, and it's good news for all who believe. It's the power of God into salvation for all who believe. So I pray that in the next few moments, God, that you'd open our hearts to hear your word and to encounter us, Lord, as we encounter you. Lord, as you encounter us through your word, Father, I pray that we would see you as alive within these scriptures, breathing over us your life. And Jesus, we thank you for that invitation to come and experience all that you have for us tonight. And we're eager to do so in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Amen. We've been in this series called The Gospel of John. This is week four. How many of you guys have been enjoying this series? I've been enjoying it immensely. I believe that there's power when we go to the gospels and we meet Jesus there. How many of you know that Jesus wants to be met in his word? Jesus is the living word. He's the logos. He's the one that speaks forth the word of God. He is the word of God. And we saw that in John chapter one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the word and the word is Jesus. And so whenever and wherever the word of God is preached, come on, that's where Jesus shows up. And we're excited tonight to experience more of what Jesus has for us. So we've been journeying through these chapters. We, we actually spent some time in chapter one, the first two weeks. And then last week, we spent some time, excuse me, we spent some time in chapter one, the last three weeks. And tonight we'll be spending some time in chapter two together. And this is one of my favorite stories that we're going to encounter here in just a moment. And so If you have your Bibles, go with me to John chapter 2. We're going to begin right there in verse 1, and here's what it says. Reading from the ESV, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Say it with me. They have no wine. How many of you guys know that when... uh, Mother Mary says they have no wine. That's, that's a problem. Yeah, we're going to find out why here in just a moment. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? Now, stop with me for just a moment. When Jesus uses the word woman in this context, it meant no disrespect, okay? In our day and age, if we hear it read that way, we're actually misreading the text. But that's not what it means in this context. There was no disrespect intended. It actually was a term of endearment. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. (laughs) It's amazing to me how much faith Mary already had in her son. Maybe because she carried him. Maybe because she remembered what the angels said. Maybe because she'd seen him do some amazing stuff around the house. I don't know, but I'm, I'm assuming that by this time in Jesus' life, Mary knew something about Jesus that other people didn't know, right? Yeah. Verse 6, now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. We're not going to have enough time tonight to dig into this, uh, the Jewish rites of purification, but if you want to study this, this is actually a really fascinating study. But moving along, verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill these jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, hallelujah, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Now, here's what I want us to hear tonight. Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely or gotten freely drunk, then they serve the poor wine, the po wine. You know what I'm saying? But, and here's what I want you to underline or highlight or swipe in your Bible. But you have kept the good wine until now. You have kept the good wine until now. The Gospel of John and and John in his commentary in verse 11 says this, this, the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, before we get to the moment that I really want to hone in on, it's interesting to me 
that it says, and his disciples believed in him, meaning he had disciples already following him who weren't believers yet. Is it possible that we can be following Jesus and yet not believe? Is it possible that we can be fans of Jesus and not yet believe? You see, I think there's a big difference between being a fan of Jesus and being a follower of Jesus. A fan comes into the crowd. A fan leans in to listen and to hear what's going on. Come on, a fan shows up when the concert's going good, when they got free tickets to attend the, the Need to Breathe, Breathe and Switch Foot concert, right? Fans show up when things are good, when things are happening. How many of you guys remember when Kanye West came to town? Two years ago, Kanye showed up. And boy, all the fans showed up. I saw people climbing in trees to get a glimpse of Kanye when he was in town with his gospel choir. I took my kids down there because I just thought it'd be fun to witness and see what that was all about. I got to tell you, it was powerful. It was amazing to me when they began to sing and they began to sing out this hallelujah chorus. And you, you could hear people in the backdrop of this Kanye was called a flash mob, if you will, saying, is he going to do any of his good songs? <laughs> People showed up because they were fans of Kanye. They, they weren't showing up because they were avid followers of Jesus. And in the same way, people had been following Jesus, but yet not believing, meaning they hadn't gone all in yet. They were still in the fan department. Maybe Jesus had wooed them with, uh, with a great invitation. We saw that actually last week. We saw the invitation to come and to follow. And we knew that the disciples didn't really know what they were signing up for, right? They were interested in wanting to know where Jesus was sleeping at night. And he's going, what do you seek? Like, what do you want from me? What, what's in your heart for why you would want to follow me? And at this point, they don't know. All they know is that John the Baptist said, behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So that's the guy I better be following. But here, in this moment, Jesus turns the water to wine. And then those that belong to him began to believe. Is it possible to belong before believe? Yes. Is it possible to believe before belong? Yes. And in this context, we see that Jesus as a rabbi, as a wise teacher, probably had already had a little bit of street cred because of what John the Baptist said about him, because of the amount of people that were starting to follow him, because of the crowds that were starting to show up. And yet Jesus hadn't done any miracles yet. This is astounding to me. John here in verse 11 says, this is the very first of his signs. The gospel of John will actually account seven. Seven. <laughs> seven signs. Sometimes they call them miracles, but they're actually signs because they're attesting to the fact that Jesus is Messiah, that Jesus is the saving one, that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the hundreds and hundreds of years of prophecy that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's word, that Jesus is God in the flesh, the word of God made incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, as I read this passage this week, and I had a little bit of time to, to spend studying it, and I started to look at what Jesus was doing here, something really stood out to me that I really feel is a prophetic word for this church and for the big C church at large. And I couldn't escape it as much as I tried. You know, sometimes when you study the Bible, um, you, you do so because you're trying to push through, right? You're trying to get to the, de the, uh, the destination of a, of a goal that you have, right? You want to finish a chapter or you want to read past something, you want to move. You speed read. Anybody speed read? Anybody remember being in high school? Speed reading for tests? <laughs> Cramming as much as you could in because the, the next day was going to be a test? But in this moment, as I, was, as I was studying the scriptures, the scriptures began to study me and they began to encounter me and God began to speak to me. And these words that I couldn't escape just kept on jumping off the page to me like sirens going off. Woo! Don't move past this, Jason. Don't miss this. Because this is for your people and this is for my church. And the words that I couldn't escape were these, but you have kept the good wine until now. We see this on the lips of the master of the feast, or we could call him the master of ceremonies. This was an important position at a Jewish wedding. 
And he says this about Jesus. Everybody serves the good wine first. How many of you guys been to a wedding where they bring out the good stuff first? Because they want to impress everyone, right? You want everybody to be dazzled by your champagne and your, your nice vino. And it says when people have drunk freely, meaning when they've had themselves a real good time with it, then they bring out the poor wine because nobody pays attention at that point because everybody's on the dance floor making a fool out of themselves, And you've got that uncle and that aunt that are just really going for it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah? No? You guys don't go to weddings or what? Okay, just making sure, just making sure. When Candace and I got married, we had what was called a cash bar, meaning we made people pay to drink freely because we have a lot of people in our family who like the bottle a little too much, if you know what I mean. All right. So we made them really have to divvy up to get to that place. But here, interestingly enough, in this wedding celebration, in this party, the master of the feast, the master of ceremonies comes to the disciples and he goes, I don't understand. Everybody always serves the good wine. Excuse me. He comes to the bridegroom and says, I don't understand. Everybody always serves like the, the, the great wine first and then the bad wine, but you're saving the best for last. He's telling this to the groom. What he doesn't know is that Jesus has done an, an amazing thing here. He's turned the water into wine. Here we have Jesus performing his very first of seven signs, his very first public miracle. And this is a big deal because Jesus is at a wedding in Galilee. If you know anything about Galilean weddings or Jewish weddings, you know that they last about a week. Now here in American culture, we do maybe a, an hour ceremony and a couple hour reception, right? If you're lucky. But in this day and age, and especially in, at Cana in Galilee, a Jewish wedding in the first century would oftentimes go for days and days and days, oftentimes a whole week. I got to tell you, wouldn't it be fun if we started to do that in our culture? So if any of you guys are planning on getting married, I will do a week-long wedding for you. You heard it here first, folks. I will make sure that we keep the party going. And some of y'all can help me too, all right? But I just think it's amazing. You know, when I went to Israel a couple of years ago, it must have been 2015. Yeah, so almost six years ago, I had the pleasure of seeing this in, in, in action, which was really cool. And what's neat about the culture, even then, but even more so now, but what's neat about the culture is that everybody comes out to celebrate. Everybody comes out to party. It's like woven into who they are as people. In fact, if you go out to a restaurant at 10 o'clock, that restaurant will be empty. And you'll say to yourself, like silly American boy Jason said to himself, where's all the people? 30 minutes later, you'll start to see moms with strollers, with babies, kids, families. Everybody comes out to party. And the party doesn't start until late, 11 p.m., the whole place was packed, and I felt like such an idiot because I had no clue. And at midnight, everybody's out in the street dancing. We got the whole thing, this party going on in the middle of Jerusalem. And I'm in the midst of it like, hey, ho, hey, ho. And I'm having the greatest time of my life. And I'm going, what is it that we're missing out on? You know what it is? We don't know how to celebrate. We don't know how to celebrate. We'll throw a quick party where we get trashed and we end up the next morning with regrets and a, and a bad hangover. But we don't know, understand the art of celebration. And there's something powerful when the people of God reclaim this. That's why when we come together as God's family, I want us to celebrate. That's why next Sunday, the 19th, we're going to celebrate. We're going to have fun. We're going to enjoy life. How many of you guys know that life is a gift to be enjoyed? Amen. If you haven't figured it out yet, come... After the service, I'll pray for you and we'll get you delivered, okay? We'll get you set free. But Jesus wants you to celebrate. He wants you to understand that this is what he created you for, to celebrate life as a gift, to celebrate wine and weddings and dancing and fun as a gift. Some of you guys are so religious, you haven't been to a party in a while. And Jesus wants to set you free, not so that you can gratify your flesh, come on, but so that you can live life to the full. And when you, you go and you travel outside the United States, like some of you have, I've spent time in Italy, I've spent time in New Zealand, I've spent time all throughout Europe, 
Mexico, Canada, some of you who've traveled all over, you'll know that other people don't have this problem that we have. <laughs> In fact, if you go to Italy, they'll party during the day, go home, take a nap, go back to work, and then party some more later that night. It's pretty amazing. But life slows down when you learn how to celebrate, when you learn not just to hustle and bustle, right? You get caught up in that rat race, just working for the weekend, trying to get by, trying to survive, trying to save up, trying to, and next thing you know, you've lived half your life and you, and you turn around and you go, what was it all for? Jesus invites us to consider celebration as a part of our lifestyle. And here in the midst of one of the great celebrations happening in scripture, two people are coming together as one and they're getting married and it's beautiful. And Jesus is there and his disciples are there. And even Jesus's mom is there, which means Jesus's mom likes to party. So if you're Catholic, I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus's mom likes to party. Take that for what you will. And in this moment, Mary, the mother of Jesus, discovers, I don't know who told her, but she comes to Jesus and says, the wine has run out. There's no more wine. It's gone. In other words, what are you going to do about it, son? And Jesus goes, woman, it's not my time yet. I'm not ready for people to know what I'm all about. And yet, he moves. And yet, he responds. And yet, he does something extraordinary that nobody was prepared for. For cultural reasons, you never want the wine to run out. Weddings were important events, and people would often come from towns and villages away, and they didn't fly, and they didn't drive their Teslas. They walked. M mostly, those that were poor didn't have horses or donkeys, so they would walk for days and days and days to get here. You didn't want the wine to run out on the first day. You didn't want it to run out on the second day. This was critical. And if the wine were to run out, it would bring great shame upon the family, upon the bride on her day where she's supposed to sparkle and shine, and on the groom whose family was most likely the ones responsible for the food and for the wine. It would bring great shame upon them and their whole family. Now, this is where I want to pivot from just understanding the context of what's happening here and telling a few jokes. I want us to hear what God wants to say to each and every one of us tonight. And it has to do with wine. Interestingly enough, wine has always been a symbol of joy, a symbol of healing, a symbol of abundance, and a symbol of gladness, even salvation, all throughout the scripture. We see it in Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. How do you buy wine and milk without money and without price? It means it's free. It means it's a gift. Uh, we see it in Joel chapter 2, verse 19, a prophetic passage that later on gets reinterpreted through the lens of Peter in the New Testament in, in the book of Acts after they're in the upper room together. But here in its original context in verse 19, it says this, the Lord answered and said to his people, behold, I am sending to you grain and wine and oil and you will be satisfied and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. Wine is a symbol of God restoring what was once lost, restoring what was once locked up in judgment, restoring that which we need as people. We need his abundance. We need his healing. We need his salvation. We need his gladness. Wine is a picture of blessing. And we see it in other places throughout the scriptures as well. But interestingly enough, there can be no wine without God's help. How many of you guys know that in order to make wine, you need grapes? And how many of you know that in order to get grapes, you need vines? And how many of you know that in order to have vines, vines must first be planted in the ground, in the soil? And how many of you know that that soil needs water? When we recognize that there is nothing that exists without God's help and intervention, 
that's when we begin to understand that everything is a gift. And we see this. We see that without God's blessing, without water, without rain, life cannot exist. Here in Utah, we understand the importance of rain, do we not? I've been so thankful for the rain that's come the last few days, but God send us more. You know, a couple weeks ago, I think it was actually a few months ago, the governor actually asked for a day of prayer, a day of prayer for rain. That's astounding to me. Saying, God, we, we recognize that without you, we're lost. Without you, we're dry. Without you, we have no life. Without you, we can't make it. May we never lose sight of that church. May we never become so caught up in our own ability to produce that we forget where it comes from. God is our provider. God is our source. He's the one that makes the water, and he's the one that makes the wine. There can be no wine without God's intervention and help. This is important. There can be no life. There can be no gladness. There can be no laughter. There can be no salvation. There can be no healing. There can be no abundance without God intervening in that picture. So here Mary is, the mother of Jesus, and she's telling Jesus, the wine has run out. There's no more wine. In other words, the celebration's gonna stop. The party's gonna end. Shame will come. Joy will be lost. That's the implication of what's at stake. But I think there's something else at stake here for us, and it's precisely around these words, the wine has run out, that I wanna focus in the next couple of minutes. Is it just me? Or does it feel like in our culture today, it, it feels like the wine has run out? Yes. Yes. In 2020, with COVID-19, it felt like the wine ran out. With the quarantines and people losing their jobs, it felt like the wine had run out. With depression being at an all-time high, it feels like the wine has run out. With suicides being up, it feels like the wine has run out. With more people addicted to opioids, it feels like the wine has run out. With more people who have lost their way, with broken families on the rise, it feels like wine has run out. With more pills being prescribed for antidepressants than ever before in the history of our world, nation, and civilization, it feels like the wine has run out. People growing up without a father, feels like the wine has run out. And even within the church, where many of us have never seen the dead raised or demons cast out or, or the blind receive their healing or people set free and delivered. It feels sometimes, yes, even among us, like the wine has run out. And when we kind of think about it like that, when we add it all up, it feels kind of overwhelming, doesn't it? I know I felt overwhelmed last year and, I, and, and even part of this year. Maybe you're here tonight and you've been going through a personal season of feeling like the wine has run out. And this is what I believe God wants to say to you tonight. He's only been saving the good wine for last. He's only been keeping the good wine until now, Chrissy. He's only been keeping the good wine until now, Jeffrey. He's only been keeping the good wine until now, Levi. He's only been keeping the good wine until now, church. Maybe you've been walking through a difficult time, a valley, a time of, of sorrow, or maybe you lost somebody you love, or maybe a relationship ended that you thought would never end, or maybe someone walked out on you or stabbed you in the back or left you when you needed them most. I know because I've been there, and it feels like the wine has run out, but I'm here to prophetically declare to all of us tonight, he's only been keeping the good wine until now. He's only been keeping the good wine until now, meaning the best is still to come. The best is still to come because guess what? He's not done yet. And if you're still breathing, he ain't done yet. Because the Bible says that the good work that he began in you and the good work that he began in me, he will complete. He will finish it. And if you're still here and you're still breathing, you're still choking down air, come on, he ain't done with you yet. And though it might feel like the wine has run out at times, and you might go through times or seasons or have faced difficulties or obstacles where it feels like there's no more wine, I'm here to tell you tonight that he's only been keeping the good wine until now. I have this expectation in my heart that as the church, we haven't seen our best days yet. And I don't just mean as courageous church. I mean, we're barely two years old. Of course we haven't seen our best days yet. 
<laughs> but I mean, is the big C church. Yeah. I was having a conversation with Tim about this uh, earlier this week. And uh, we were just talking about, and, and, and maybe even in the, in the same way that we were having a conversation, almost lamenting the fact that it seems like our culture has become so obsessed with moving beyond what we see in God's word and relabeling and deconstructing and almost mocking things that are innocent and pure. And with the vantage point that we have, knowing what we know now in our sophisticated, educated mindsets, we look down on things that seem so elementary from the 90s and 2000s, or perhaps for you older ones, the 70s and 80s. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and sometimes, if you've been following Jesus long enough, it feels like, God, is there any more wine left? Or has it all ran out? Like, are there going to be any more major miracles or, or moves of God or revivals or renewals or awakenings or reformations or renaissances within our lifetime? And we might be saying to ourselves, I don't know. It feels like the wine has run out. But here's what I heard the Holy Spirit say to me this week. He's only been keeping the good wine until now. Meaning, he's not done yet. And I believe the best is still to come. Jesus saves the best for last. They go, I can't believe you. He brought out all the, all the good wine. I mean, normally they, they, they bring that out first and then the cheap stuff, but you've saved the best to last. But isn't that what Jesus does? Isn't that who Jesus is? We serve a good God. A God who never turns his back on his kids. Sometimes it might feel like you're going through a, a dark night of your soul times when you don't have it all together. And that's okay. It's okay to not be okay sometimes. Because in those moments, Jesus wants to remind you, child, I've got wine for you. Keep following. Keep dancing. But Jesus, the song's about to stop. Keep dancing. But Jesus, the wine's about to go out. Keep drinking. I've got more for you. I've got more for you. I've got more for you. As I began to hear the Holy Spirit say that to me this week, I just thought about the church all over the world. I thought about what's going on in Afghanistan. I thought about what's going on in Cuba. I thought about what's going on in Haiti. I thought about what's going on in Australia with people being locked up right now. I, th I thought about what's going on all over the world. And, and, and it feels like the wine has run out. Like, have we lost our minds? Have we just lost our way? And then I, hold, I heard the Holy Spirit say, no, Jason, I'm, I'm saving the good wine. I'm saving the good wine. I believe that in these next few years, we're going to see God move like never before. I really believe that. I believe that this setback has been a setup for one of the great comeback stories of all time. And here's the good news. You and I get to be a part of that. If you're here, you get to be a part of that. Courageous Church, you get to be a part of of serving the good wine to the world. Right. How do I know? Because here's what Joel chapter two says prophetically, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my wine. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men and women shall see visions even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. God's about to pour another glass, guys. He's saying, I'm about to bring some new wine in the earth that you haven't seen or experienced or even tasted yet. I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm thirsty for that. I, I'm, I'm eager and expectant for that. I really want to see God pour out new wine. I want to see God pour out his spirit. Wine and the presence and the pouring out of his spirit are symbolic for one another. They, they're metaphors of each other. And then verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. How many of you are ready for God to do some wonders in the heavens and on the earth? Blood and fire and columns of smoke. Whoa. Whoa. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Verse 32, and it shall come to pass that everyone, say everyone, everyone. 
everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So church, what do you do when your wine, when your wine runs out? What do you do? You call on the name of Jesus. You cry out to Jesus. Jesus, my wine's run out. Jesus, I'm at the end of my rope and I don't know what to do. Jesus, my employees just quit on me. Jesus, my grandma has COVID-19 and she's on a ventilator. Jesus, it feels like the wine is about to run out. It feels like it has run out. Need your help. What does Joel say? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not just a few, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. You know what I love about this? Is that it means that that God will move in any situation, in any family, regardless of how dysfunctional it is. He'll move in your life. He'll move in my life when we call on his name. In turning the water to wine, Jesus demonstrates the power and authority that he has over all creation and over every obstacle or situation that you and I will ever face. Just as the text declares in verse 11, that in the working of this sign, Jesus manifested his glory. I believe in the same way. We're going to see Jesus manifest his glory in some very new and exciting ways. And he's going to do it in and through your brokenness. He's going to do it through your emptiness. See, the lie that many of us come to believe about the church or even about following Jesus is that we got to get our act together first and then we can follow that we've somehow got to clean up our act before we can come to church or get involved in the life of a community or even call on the name of Jesus. And yet that's not what we see at all. We see a Messiah, a loving Savior, a King who serves, who keeps the good wine until last. We see that God, our God, the Almighty God, step in when people call upon his name. Jesus, I need you. I'm here. Jesus, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm with you. Jesus, this hurts really bad. I know. But I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. And I've got good wine for you on the other side of your trial. I've got good wine for you on the other side of this tribulation. I've got good wine for you on the other side of this persecution. I've got good wine for you on this other side of feeling marginalized, marginalized and downcast. And I've got good wine for you even when you don't think there could be any possible wine left in the jar. He's got more. He's got more. He's got more. He's only been keeping the good wine until now. I hope you're encouraged by this. I believe that we're going to see God do extraordinary things in the days to come. But you know what? God's not going to do it without you. He wants you involved. He wants you involved. He doesn't want you to miss out. Some of you have disqualified yourself because of past mistakes. And tonight, God is healing your heart. He's doing that right now. I can feel it all over this room. Some of you have discredited yourself because you don't have the education you think you need. And that couldn't be further from the truth. God is healing your heart right now. He's speaking to you right now. Some of you think, well, I could never do this or I could never do that because of this, this, and this. And that couldn't be further from the truth. God wants you involved in the ways that he's going to manifest glory all throughout this valley and beyond. And if you believe that, say amen tonight. Can we pray together? Father God, I thank you for the good wine that you have for us. Thank you that you've only been keeping the good wine until now. Even when it feels like the wine has run out, you're saying to us as a church tonight, I have more for you. I have more for you, and you haven't even tasted it yet. It's good wine. It's it's precious wine. It's the presence of God. 
And the fragrance of your Holy Spirit is what it is. And you long to fill us with your Holy Spirit. You long to fill us with yourself. So that we wouldn't go through life trying to do life on our own terms, but so that we would be filled with who you are. The overflow of who you are. Your presence and your goodness and your grace. What gifts these are to us, Lord. Lord, help us to be a people that celebrate all the good gifts that you long to give us. Help us not to stay on the sideline, Lord, when you've called us to get on the dance floor. Help us not to refrain when you're calling us to drink deeply of your Holy Spirit. And God, I just pray for people in this room that have been going through a tough time, that feel discouraged, that feel broken, that feel lost, maybe confused. God, what do I do? I just don't feel like I'm living a life of purpose even. God, would you speak to those hearts right now? Would you pour out your wine? Would you pour out your spirit? Would you pour out your presence, your healing power right now? I just want to allow the Holy Spirit to move here in these next few moments that we have together. Because I believe his work is not yet finished for us tonight, but if you're here in this place tonight, I don't need you to come down to the altar or to get out of your chair. But if you would say to me, Pastor Jason, I feel empty. I feel dry. Would you just lift your hand right now with with all eyes closed all around this room? Would you just lift your hand? There's hands all over this room. And I want to pray for you specifically right now. God, would you pour out your wine? Would you pour out your spirit upon these beautiful, beloved souls, God? Would you fill them to the brim with everlasting life? Would you restore unto them the joy of your salvation, Lord? May they know joy again like they've never known before. And may the powers and pressures and weights of the world now be stripped away. May their cares be cast at your feet. And Holy Spirit, would you minister life right now? Would you heal? Would you restore? Would you encourage? Do it, Lord, for our good, but for your glory. Father, would you manifest your glory all over this room right now, in us, through us? Maybe you're here tonight and you've been facing some decisions that you need to make, some tough decisions about people that have been what I call Life suckers. <laughs> They've been sucking the life right out of you. And God's been speaking to you about building better boundaries around your heart and about taking time to really care for yourself, to Sabbath, to rest, to be renewed. And you're just having a hard time finding that, that rest, finding that peace for your soul. You just feel disturbed That's the picture I see right now, like just a cloud of confusion, a a disturbance in the force, if you will. There's just something inside of you that feels chaotic. Would you just lift your hand? I just want to pray for you as well. Okay, even more hands. Father, I just thank you that right now in these moments, Lord, without fanfare, without music, without a soundtrack, Holy Spirit, you're just going to move. You're just going to do what only you can do. Even for those watching online, you're going to do what only you can do, God. You're going to heal. You're going to restore. You're going to bring peace where there is confusion because you're not the author of chaos. You're the author of life. You're the perfecter of our faith. You're the writer of our story. And so, God, would you come and and write a new chapter and begin a new chapter in these beautiful folks tonight? Lord, let today be a day that they look back on where they remember you bringing new wine into their life, new joy, new hope. I see many of you that have dreams that feel unfulfilled and you're like, God, it feels like all is lost. And and he here tonight is saying, no, (laughs) no, my child, I've only been keeping the good wine until now. I've got more in store for you. Hang on. Hang in there. I've got you. You're not overlooked. I haven't lost sight of you. I see you. He is the God who sees, and he sees you tonight. 
And maybe you're here tonight and you've just been in a place where it feels like maybe you've been or, or have been about to, to walk out on your faith. Because you're like, I've been believing, but what's it all for? And he wants to encourage you tonight. He can turn the water into wine. He can take your emptiness and you, what seems earthly and limited and normal and ordinary, and he can turn it into something that's extraordinary, something that's sweet, something that's so good. God, would you encourage us tonight? Prophetically, Lord, I just speak life over your people tonight. I declare things that aren't as though they are, Lord. Would every person in this room experience the good wine that you have for them in the mighty name of Jesus? And all God's people said amen. Amen. And amen. Did you receive that tonight?